North Korea does not seem to be willing to back down from the high-level tit-for-tats with the U.S., as it has on Thursday specified that its Guam missile strike plan would be ready by mid-August. Pyongyang's statement deepens security concerns as it comes on the heels of Washington's confidential assessment that the regime has successfully produced a miniaturized nuclear warhead that can fit inside its missiles, crossing a critical point in becoming a full-fledged nuclear state. North Korea's track record of following through its words is also why Thursday's statement from the North's state-run Korean Central News Agency cannot be taken lightly and is seen as Pyongyang's move to increase its leverage against Washington. With an annual Seoul-Washington joint military exercise scheduled to take place later this month, experts are speculating that tensions surrounding the Korean Peninsula will continue to intensify in August. Military solutions are now fully in place, locked and loaded. Should North Korea act unwisely, hopefully Kim Jong-un will find another path. The North Korean military says it's developing a plan to envelop Guam in ballistic missiles. That plan, according to the Korean People's Army, should be finished by the middle of this month. They'll present that to Kim Jong-un, and then he will decide whether to execute it. President Trump and his message for North Korea telling reporters today that his first warning of fire and fury perhaps was not tough enough. The president saying today, let's see what North Korea does with Guam and said if they take any action, the response will be, quote, an event the likes of which nobody has seen before. ABC senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega leading us off. President Trump tonight with a new warning for North Korea if they follow through on that threat against Guam. Let's see what he does with Guam. He does something in Guam. It will be an event the likes of which nobody's seen before, what will happen in North Korea. He will see. It's not a dare. It's a statement. He's not going to go around threatening Guam, and he's not going to threaten the United States, and he's not going to threaten Japan, and he's not going to threaten South Korea. The president delivering those tough words at his Bedminster Golf Club. And on the front steps of the club house with the vice president by his side, he didn't hesitate to also take on Pyongyang, calling his fire and fury Hello, statement everybody. nonsense. Well, I don't think they mean that. And I think they, uh, it's the first time they've heard it like they heard it. Uh, and frankly, uh, the people that were questioning that statement, was it too tough? Maybe it wasn't tough enough. It's about time that somebody stuck up for the people of this country and for the people of other countries. So uh, if anything, maybe that statement wasn't tough enough. He is not backing down, but he's also not telegraphing what comes next. As for a preemptive strike? We don't talk about that. I never do. As for negotiations? Sure. We'll always consider negotiations. But this is President Trump's first real test over nuclear weapons. And in his first interview after the inauguration, the president told David he was confident he would do the right thing. Let me ask you, right after the oath of office, they gave you the nuclear codes, the biscuit. Right. How somber? Somber. How Very somber. Sobering moment? When they explain what it represents and the kind of destruction that you're talking about, it is a very sobering moment. Yes, it's very, very, uh, very scary in a sense. Does it keep you up at night? No, but it's uh, confidence that I'll do the right thing and the right job. But it's a very, very scary thing. In North Korea, marching in the street, the country rallying as it issued that threat to strike the U.S. territory of Guam. The president lobbed one more shot before walking off. And I will tell you this, North Korea better get their act together or they're going to be in trouble like few nations ever have been in trouble in this world. Okay? Secretary Tillerson is back in the U.S. after his trip, and what is he saying there, Rich? Yeah, he has just returned from a trip to Asia, several days on a diplomatic mission, much of it focused on North Korea and this issue, trying to get allies and adversaries to cut off North Korea diplomatically and economically. Uh, despite two intercontinental ballistic missile launches since the 4th of July, the State Department contends that this pressure campaign is actually working. State Department officials say that countries that we're close friends with and countries that we're not close friends with are helping to participate in that campaign and that's because the world recognizes the threat that North Korea faces not to the United States but also the world. The State Department also points to sanctions that the UN Security Council passed 
during last weekend, China and Russia signed on to those sanctions at the UN Security Council, allowing them to pass. And we asked the State Department whether China is doing enough here because it is North Korea's strongest ally. Uh, what they're saying is that China has been improving in its pressure on North Korea, but there's still more it could do. If North Korea does anything in terms of even thinking about attack, of anybody that we love or we represent or our allies or us, they can be very, very nervous. I'll tell you what, and they should be very nervous because things will happen to them like they never thought possible. That was President Trump earlier today delivering yet another stern warning to North Korea and Kim Jong-un. Here now, Fox News contributor, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., John Bolton is with us. This now, after really a number of presidents and the policy of appeasement and the worst obviously in this case was Bill Clinton the worst on Iran was Barack Obama but for the president to go out there and say uh, sorry this is a statement of fact this isn't a dare this is not the, the this means something how does how is that a game changer considering probably North Korea thinks they can roll America for another you know 50 billion dollars in free money and and not keep their word well, sure. After 25 years of failed policies, uh, you can't count on North Korea appreciating because of their astute political uh, insights that the, the leadership in America has changed. And that's why I think clear statements from the president are important. There are two, two elements here. One is uh, if there's an attack from uh, North Korea on Guam, that's American soil. The citizens of Guam are American citizens. And at that point, uh, you don't even want to think about what the retaliation would be. That's clear, and I think stating that uh, is important so that there's no misunderstanding. The second issue, though, is whether or not the president should strike preemptively. And I think on that score, uh, there's a legitimate debate, but I think people have to ask themselves whether they're prepared to see North Korea with deliverable nuclear weapons as far as the eye can see. I am not willing to tolerate that risk. Well, I, I tend to agree with you, but I also am, I shudder to think of the human carnage that's involved here. I, you know, the, the, the best scenario would be, oh, Kim Jong-un gets the message, he grows up, he stops the saber rattling, stops firing missiles, lets the world go in and, and inspect what he's doing. But we both know that's not going to happen. Short of that, is there anything you can think of militarily that we would be able to do that would effectively shut down their ability to launch those weapons? Well, number one, I do think there's one diplomatic option. We talked about it before. That's persuading China to help us reunify the peninsula. But if that diplomatic option is out, there are a huge range of military alternatives. And, and that's why uh, it's important for the American people to make the decision. Are you prepared to live with a nuclear North Korea or are you not? Susan Rice argues in the New York Times today, she's perfectly prepared Tolerate to live with nuclear, nuclear weapons. Yeah. Look, and she and many people like her argued for 25 years, you know, we can talk the North out of nuclear weapons. So their track record uh, leaves something to be desired. Obviously, no one wants to see carnage on the Korean Peninsula. No one wants to see the Americans there in peril or the people in South Korea or Japan. But let's be clear. Who's ultimately in peril here if North Korea has deliverable nuclear weapons and, I might say, Iran at the same time? The people who are really in jeopardy are the citizens of the United States. So that's, that's to me, me is the bottom the, line. The last question that I asked General Keene on a scale of 1 to 10, how dangerous is this to the world and the United States right now? I think it's very dangerous. I think this is uh, our, our day's uh, analogy to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't think we really have confidence. We know what Kim Jong-un and his generals will decide. That's one of the reasons why if there's going to be military action, it ought to be sooner rather than later. This situation does not get better for the United States over time. It continuously gets worse and more dangerous. And millions could potentially die. Exactly. American citizens. Frightening. All right. Ambassador, thank you. Chilling Thank you. times. President Trump stood by his warning for North Korea on Thursday, saying his promise of fire and fury may not have been tough enough. The president also commented on China's role in containing North Korea and how the U.S. might urge China to get involved. I think China can do a lot more, yes. China can. And I think China will do a lot more. Look, we have trade with China. We lose hundreds of billions of dollars a year on trade with China. They know how I feel. It's not going to continue like that. But if China helps us, I feel a lot differently for trade. 
CBS News foreign correspondent Ben Tracy is in Beijing. So, Ben, President Trump has been critical of China's unwillingness to be tough on North Korea in the past, and you heard what he had to say there. Break down for us what the president was talking about and what else the U.S. can do to pressure China's government to act. Well, it's clear with China the president is definitely using a carrot and stick approach. On one day, he will compliment them for their efforts to try to rein in North Korea. They did go along with those very tough U.S. sanctions that really upset North Korea. And then on another day, he will threaten them with a trade war. The Chinese government came out just a few weeks ago and very explicitly warned the United States not to link North Korea to trade between the two countries. The president has doubled down on that, saying that he would give them a better deal if they somehow do more with North Korea. Now, what exactly do more on North Korea is, is unclear. We don't know at this point how much North Korea will even listen to China. It does account for about 90 percent of its trade, China does, with uh, North Korea. But it's unclear how much leverage China has at this point. Well, Senator Lindsey Graham said in an interview Thursday that, quote, war will only happen if China completely fails in stopping North Korea, and China could do more if they choose. I want China to have the choice of having to deal with a nut job in their backyard, which would be very unpleasant and rein him in, or have a war in their backyard. So Senator Graham echoed some of what the president said, but what motivation does China have to pressure North Korea into stopping the regime's testing of ballistic missiles and development of nuclear weapons? Yeah, I think when we talk about China, it's important to break down what they want and what they don't want. China does not see their role as simply to make the U.S. happy and solve this problem for it. In fact, China has very has said almost every week that this is not their problem to solve. They say the U.S. needs to start talking to North Korea if they want this problem solved. China does not want North Korea to have nuclear weapons. That is not in their self-interest. But they also don't want the regime to collapse. They fear if the North Korean regime collapses, then you have this instability on the Korean Peninsula. You could have a refugee crisis on the 900-mile-long border that China shares with North Korea. And worse yet, you could have a war. And China knows that if it does come to war, it's very likely that South Korea and the U.S. would win that war. And then you conceivably could have a unified Korea with the United States military on China's border. That is not something it wants. So China's approach is how do we contain this? How do we end the weapons program, but not end the north-south dynamic that currently exists on the Korean Peninsula? Thank you for watching Right Wing. Your support really does mean the world to me. I hope you have an amazing rest of the day, and I will see you tomorrow.